Now I'm going to get speaker view. And when I put myself here, I'm spotlighted. Okay. So, um, let's see, was that always speaker? Okay. Uh, welcome to our third meeting. Uh, we still have a few people probably arriving, but we have our two co-hosts, uh, Kim and Danny, here. Uh, Peter had to be someplace else, but he'll be back next time. Uh, so um, I think you all know the readings and, and have presumably done them. Uh, this time I looked over the various articles and... Uh, they seem to divide, or anyway, I divided them into three uh, different categories. So we're going to do them in three bunches. The first uh, is uh, articles about the SI itself, very specifically, what kind of group it is, their attitudes, and so on. Uh, the second, uh, and that's like five different articles. The second one is things about the global system the geopolitics one, the bad days will end, where they're talking about, you know, overall radical strategies and history of the re revolutionary movement and the thing about nature and classes and ideologies. And the final one, like on art, language, and culture, would have that uh, thing about the avant-garde of presence and all the king's men about language and poetry and the art questionnaire so getting started uh and i think the last one will probably be a little shorter it's not as much text and we've also already discussed some of these art things in previous meetings so uh starting out with that first one the the other two will probably take about 40 minutes each uh including the q a so um uh, just going through those five things about the SI chronologically, or as we, as we read them in here. We'll start out with the fifth SI conference in Gothenburg, which is Gothenburg in English, 1961. And, um, you know, they account, they said the situationists met there, and uh, it's kind of a, a sort of minutes of their thing or some, some summing up of that. And early on, it says Raoul Vanagem, who at this time is a relatively new member, member. he's been there for maybe a year or something, uh, and is has become one of the definite influential people in the group, along with De Boer and Cotagny. Uh, and he's giving a report, and part of his report goes as follows. The existing world in both its capitalist and supposedly anti-capitalist variants, organizes life in the form of spectacles. The point is not to elaborate a spectacle of refusal, but to refuse the spectacle. In order for the, uh, their elaboration to be artistic in the new and authentic sense defined by the SI, the elements of the destruction of the spectacle must precisely cease to be works of art. There is no such thing as situationism or a situationist work of art or a spectacular situation, situationist, once and for all. So in the next paragraph, it says, the second session begins with reports from the various sections, primarily concerning the publication and translation of SI texts. The Scandinavian section also raises the issue of the production of experimental films in Sweden in which several of his mem its members have been collectively involved. The Swedes present in Gothenburg have been discussing among themselves which of these films attain a level worthy of being termed situationist and ask the conference to help settle this question. De Boer replies, and this is a real gem, that since he himself has never made a situationist film, he is in no position to judge. 
So as I note in the note, this is wickedly ironic because he had made three films. And if any film was situationist, it was certainly them <laughs> more than anything else. So if he says, well, I, I know nothing about that. I've never never made one so I'm, I'm not in position <laughs> uh, so that's really pulling the rug out from these other very probably very lame films that just sort of had some little situationist <laughs> something or other in it supposedly uh, Kunzelman expresses a strong skepticism as to the powers the SI can bring together in order to act on the level envisaged by Vanagem Kotanyi responds to Nash and Kunzelman, quote, Since the beginning of the movement, there has been a problem as to what to call artistic works by members of the SI. It was understood that none of them was a situationist production, but what to call them? I propose a very simple rule to call them anti-situationist. Uh, I don't mean that anyone should stop painting or writing, etc. I don't mean that that has no value. I don't mean that we could continue to exist without doing that. Remember, at this point, most of the SI members are artists of some sort or another. But at the same time, we know that such works will be co-opted by the society and used against us, unquote. The responses to Kotanyi's proposal are all favorable. It is noted that would-be avant-garde artists are beginning to appear in various countries who have no connection with the SI, but who refer to themselves as adherents of, quote, situationism, unquote, or describe their works as being more or less situationist. This trend is obviously going to increase, and it would be hopeless for the SI to try and prevent it. While various confused artists, nostalgic for a positive art, call themselves situationist, anti-situationist art will be the mark of the best artists, those of the SI, since genuinely situationist conditions have as yet not at all been created. Admitting this is the mark of a situationist. With one exception, the conference unanimously decides to adopt this rule of anti-situationist art, binding on all members of the SI. In other words, it, they take this seriously. In other words, any, any of those members there who went out and said, hey, this is a situationist painting, they're going to get excluded. <laughs> you already agreed. <laughs> you must explicitly label this an anti-situationist painting or whatever your <laughs> whatever it is so only nash objects his spite and indignation having become increasingly sharp throughout the whole debate to the point of uncontrolled rage dot 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 and later in the uh, account of this conference they note that the german situationist uh, who had agreed with this anti-situationist deal, uh, you know, had said, oh, yeah, we're on board with this. But it points out that uh, later on, they publish an issue of their journal called Spur that was a, they call it a, a distinct regression. In other words, it was going back to these kind of quasi-artistic things. Their on, the, on that, they were all excluded, uh, the people who were involved with that. Um, and then a few months later, uh, and this is described later, not, not after that conference, but a few, few months after the Germans are excluded, Nash and some of his uh, cronies uh, come up with this sort of putsch <laughs> or sort of, you know, in which they kind of claim that... The, you know, they're the real situationists and all this. So that's talked about in the next article, which is a, the, a year later called the Counter Situationist Campaign in Various Countries. And do I have that? Let me do. Typo. So uh, in that 
article, they note that there are various ways that people can oppose the situation. This one is by police. The police can arrest them <laughs> and so on, or by silence. And they mentioned France as being an example of that, like, you know, uh, everybody pretends, oh, I never heard of those people. Uh, and then falsification, which and he says Scandinavia is the breeding ground for that recently. And they then they talk about Nash and his various lying proclamations and, and so on. Uh, then after doing that at some length, they said, we don't want to attribute some particular perversity to Nash and, Nash and his associates. It seems to us that Nashism is an expression of an objective tendency resulting from the SI's ambiguous and risky policy of consenting to act within culture while being against the entire present organization of this culture and even against all culture as a separate sphere. And then kind of segueing into a little different point, the SI cannot be a massive organization and it will not even accept disciples as do the conventional avant-garde groups. We need to discover and open up the Northwest Passage to a new revolution that cannot tolerate masses of followers, a revolution that must surge over that central terrain which has until now been sheltered from revolutionary upheavals, namely the conquest of everyday life. We will only organize the detonation. The free explosion must escape us and any other control forever. One of the classic weapons of the old world, perhaps the one most used against groups delving into the organization of life, is to single out and isolate a few of their participants as stars. We have to defend ourselves against this process, which, like almost all the usual wretched choices of the present society, has an air of being natural. Those among us who aspired to the role of stars or depended on stars had to be rejected. Uh, the third uh, article I won't even read from. It's that brief uh, SI anti-public relations notice. Uh, I think it's easy enough to, to see. They're just saying, oh, okay, they get letters or people say, hey, I'm on board with the SI. I want to join. And so this would be a response to all those people. I say, okay, you like the SI, you love the SI. You're on, you know, you you agree with it. Okay. You want to join the SI? Well, let's see. Uh, and they give them those two options, or not options, I mean, have, have to do both. They have to take a thesis of the SI and develop it. And uh, then they have to take another thesis of the SI and destroy it, take it apart, demolish it. Uh, and then they point out afterwards you know like this is we're not being arbitrary here this is something that we often do to kind of you know it's, it's kind of a way of brainstorming you might say and uh by doing this uh we can sometimes discover new ideas and get rid of poor ones develop the good ones and also see like if you really are on board with us, because uh, if you can't do that, if all you can do is just say you agree with us, that's not enough. You've got to show that that agreement has some substance, which means that you're capable of disagreeing and why, explaining why. So then the fourth uh, text is now the SI. And um, we're, we're now getting into, I believe that would be in 1964, uh, that that's number nine is, is there. And um, by this time, that battle with the various artistic currents has pretty much been won by the so-called political, <laughs> you know, uh, Deborah and Van Jim and these people who are saying revolution is what this is about. We may be involved with art and culture in one way or the other, but we are revolutionaries first, not artists who have some revolutionary lingo added on. Um, 
And so this one short piece, uh, it, it's a real gem, very incisive piece. I, I like it a lot. You know, they're kind of taking stock after this is, you know, they won this. So uh, they're looking at the things like now we've, we've come along, a lot of people are uh, pretending to agree with us now because some of our ideas have come up, you know, other people say, no, they're not good, you know, and the SI in this article, they're pointing out that uh, the reason for these ambiguities is that because the SI is a modern group that is really looking at modern society as it is developing now, that it is overlapping with the rulers, the ruling currents of this society, because that's, in a way, that's what they're doing too. You know, the people who are at the top or the people who are kind of the idea men for the people at the top are saying, well, what's coming up in the next decades? They may be doing it in order to say, how can we make more money? Or how can we keep in power, you know, as we shift from a labor society to a more leisure society or whatever the various trendy topics are. Uh, and uh, so in a way, they're using modern technology, you know, computers and things like that are just developing then, but uh, the situationists can look forward and see, well, decades from now, people will be doing all this computer stuff. And so the top people are also thinking about that. What what do we do about that? Will everything be automated? Will we, you know, will we be able to spy on everybody and record all their phone calls? You know, whatever the various things are. And the situationists were constantly pointing out at this time, uh, as they say here, that we're on the same path with our deadly enemies, you know, and the best man will win. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're both wrestling with these topics. What can we do with these technologies? They want to use these technologies to implement a police state or, a, you know, a big brother kind of thing or a brave new world kind of thing. We want to use them to, you know, uh, foster people's creativity, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what they're talking about in these things says our project has taken shape at the same time as the modern tendencies toward integration. There is thus not only a direct opposition between them, but also an air of resemblance, since the two sides are really contemporaneous. We must not, for all that, abandon the extreme point of the modern world merely as so as to avoid resembling it in any way or even in order not to teach it anything that could be used against us. It is quite natural that our enemies succeed in partially using us. We are neither going to leave the present field of culture to them, nor mix with them. The armchair advisors who want to admire and understand us from a respectful distance readily recommend to us the purity of the first attitude while they themselves adopt the second one. This is a very subtle point, and it's absolutely true. <laughs> uh, we reject this suspect formalism. Like the proletariat, we cannot claim to be unexploitable under the present conditions. The best we can do is to strive to make any such exploitation entail the greatest possible risk for the exploiters. The present era can test innumerable innovations, technological or otherwise, but it is incapable of putting them to good use because it is chained to the fundamental conservation of an old order. Over and over in all our innovating formulations, here he's talking about the situationists, we must stress the need for a revolutionary transformation of society. The revolutionary critique of all existing conditions does not, to make sh be sure, have a monopoly on intelligence. It only has a monopoly on its use. And here, of course, the SI is talking about itself and the few people who are sort of in the same ballpark. 
Uh, in the present cultural and social crisis, those who do not know how to use their intelligence have in fact no discernible intelligence of any kind. And here they go on to list six top trendy, undeniably intelligent people who they say, forget it. Stop talking about unused intelligence and you'll make us happy. Poor Heidegger, poor Lukash, poor Sartre, poor Bart, poor Lefebvre, poor, poor, poor Cardin. Ticks, ticks, and ticks. They're sort of, uh, they're, they're turning this uh, uh, paragraph from Lautremont where he, back in the 19th century, is saying similar things about artists, that he's saying, all oh, these big t Hugo and blah, 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 they're just tch, tch, nothings uh, beneath contempt. Lacking the method for using their intelligence, they end up with nothing but caricatural fragments of the innovating ideas that can simultaneously comprehend and contest the totality of our era. This last would be, again, things like the situationists. Uh, they're saying when these people come across something like our articles, say, uh, they... They can't, they recognize that it's something significant, but because they've locked themselves into a specialist hierarchical position, all they can do is kind of imitate the style or take some little aspect of it. Uh, they made particularly the example that came up uh, last time where uh, they have Lefebvre, one of the people they mentioned, who takes a few things from the situation is Paris commune things and kind of makes a whole book out of it, you know, which is, doesn't amount to that much. You know, he doesn't even know how to, anyway. Uh, the specialists of thought can no longer be anything but thinkers of specialization. We don't claim to have a monopoly on the dialectics that everyone talks about. We only claim to have a temporary monopoly on its use. Uh, so then I'll go on to the last uh, thing here, the questionnaire. Uh, there were two questionnaires, but this is this is the questionnaire that the SI made up about itself. And there are just two uh, little questions here I, I'll read. Is the Situationist International a political movement? Answer, the word political movement to today connote the specialized activity of group and party bosses who derive the oppressive force of their future power from the organized passivity of their militants. So they're talking about things like the head of the Communist Party or the head of a labor union, the, the chief socialist premier or whatever. The SI wants nothing to do with any form of hierarchical power whatsoever. It strives to illuminate and coordinate the gestures of refusal and the signs of creativity that are defining the new contours of the proletariat, the irreducible desire for freedom. Whenever new radical currents appear, as for example, recently in Japan, the extremist wing of the Zengakuren, in the Congo, in the revolts there, and in the Spanish underground, against Franco, the SI gives them critical support and thereby aids them practically. But in contrast to all the so-called transitional programs of specialized politics, the SI insists on a permanent revolution of everyday life. I think that's so as if to say, they're going to say, okay, great, Zen Cochran, great, you guys working in the underground in Spain or whatever. Uh, but this doesn't mean that we're on board with everything that you're going to come up with. Like if you take over uh, the Congo, uh, we're still going to look at what are you doing there? Of course, we support your fight against colonialism. That goes without saying. But 
it doesn't mean that we're just on board with some group that's going to say, hey, we've won. We're the National Liberation Front of this or that. And then here's a second question. Do you consider it necessary to call yourselves situationists? Or why do you consider it? In the existing order, this is their answer, where things take the place of people, any label is compromising. The one we have chosen, however, embodies its own critique in that it is automatically opposed to any, quote, situationism, the label that others would like to saddle us with. Moreover, it will disappear when all of us have become fully situationist and are no longer proletarians struggling for the end of the proletariat. For the moment, however ridiculous a label may be, Ours has the merit of drawing a sharp line between the previous incoherence and a new level of rigor. Such incisiveness is just what has been lacking in the thought of the last few decades. And then there's one later question. Are you Marxists? Answer, just as much as Marx was when he said, I am not a Marxist. End of that. So, um, I'd now like to shift to uh, Q&A, and you can also have questions in the chat, uh, as well as raising your digital hand. And uh, uh, I would just point out, it, it's probably obvious that, uh, uh, first of all, keep the questions very brief so we can handle a lot of them. And also bear in mind that all this is being recorded. <laughs> So don't say come up with some inflammatory something that you wouldn't want to be on YouTube 10 years from now or <laughs> that uh, your your fellow, uh, you know, whoever <laughs> might might see online or something like that. J just just ask a simple factual question about did the situation is do this or this. So, uh, oh, Edward, can you unmute yourself? I did. Hi. Okay. Um, Ken, you mentioned something about five minutes ago. You said two things, and by the time you got to the two things, I didn't remember what the two things were. You said uh, those two things are very important. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Uh, not offhand. <laughs> it may come up again. Uh, it was about five minutes ago, seven minutes ago. Um, While I was reading those texts? Yes, yes, yes. And you said that uh, you, you you itemized two things, and then you went immediately, and you said these two, two things are very important. But I couldn't remember what the two things were by the okay. time you. I'm, I'm sure if they were important, I'm sure it will come <laughs> up again. Come up again, and, okay. and then you can. You can say well, if, if it comes up, I'll understand what it was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, now David. we've got uh, Dave. I just wanted to point out to anyone who may have missed it that all of the talk about Nashism. And all of the coinages of words involving the word Nash uh, sound disruptingly like Nazism, and they're supposed to. No doubt. It also sounds kind of nasty, don't you think? <laughs> I don't know if that would come across in French. Uh, Ed Matthews. Okay, I'm, I'm muted myself. Quick question. Uh, Ken, would you think that the SI's uh, sense of autocritique could be considered a Maoist a little bit? Or because I never got the feeling that the SI cozied up to Maoism in any great degree or to any great degree. And yet autocritique was something that was associated with a kind of Maoist way of thinking in the 1960s. Uh, would you agree with that statement or that's completely a false reading. Oh, oh, absolutely zero to do with Maoism. But bear in mind that uh, they can use anything. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, if you like the term consciousness raising, for example, uh, I think is kind of permanently damaged because it had such a, an element of that kind of quality. Like we're going to sit in right. here and, uh, you know, do this. Uh, I, I mean, so... Uh, I would only use it sort of ironically <laughs> uh, if I used it. Well, in this the same way, like uh, uh, to criticize yourself, uh, 
uh, is not to say, I mean, uh, when I need help, <laughs> something's going on, you know, that's one of the first things I look at, like, where am I going wrong here? What, uh, you know, da, da, da. Uh, I mean, there's other issues about being tactful if you're criticizing people and so on, but it's a valuable thing, but it's not at all the same, like the so-called self-criticism things of Maoism is, I mean, this is just like, it's almost worse than the Nazis. It's like, mm -hmm. it's as if the Nazis not only rounded up the Jews, but insisted that the Jews stand up and give a speech about how disgusting they were. Yeah. I mean, even the Nazis generally didn't do that. They just said, okay, you're our enemies. Fuck you. You, uh, you know, but the Maoists, I mean, they would have, you know, like they're arresting somebody for some probably completely bullshit reason. And they would insist that the daughter and son of that person denounce him. And that was, Hence the idea of yeah. you know, I mean, what does that have to do with, you know, this is like the ultimate, ultimate extreme opposite of anything the SI would ever, yeah. you know, yes, uh, uh, you know, you could, you could say uh, that at certain points in situationist history, including all the succeed other groups like me and people like that coming in, that maybe some of these rigorous things were carried on to extremely or too without sense of humor or <laughs> so you know you can make criticisms like that like this was too hard lined or i don't like that tone or or something like that uh that's another matter but but uh uh the idea of being less critic i i mean criticism is the whole part of this thing you know it's yeah. like if you're not doing that you're not doing shit you know, this yeah. is, I mean, and it, that goes back to Marx and actually it goes back to Hegel in sort of indirectly, you know, like nothing's happening until you, you know, negate something, you know, plunge through something. And uh, so uh, the ad, uh, when, when the situationists are saying we often do this, it's not saying that we have some thing where we're pounding on somebody for being sinful or something it means that if if it's something we take seriously like say that thing about calling it anti-situationist uh for an a, an outsider might say well god talk about a quibble you know situationist under who gives a shit you know but for them you can see why this is important they don't you know and so because it is important if somebody was going to go against that thing that they voted for at the conference, they're out of there. You know, this is not a joking matter. It means you lied or uh, maybe you intended to do it, but you were just you didn't know what you were talking about. And so you're out of here. We know what we're talking about and we want to move on in this mode. You know, and uh, you can go off and do whatever you like. It may be good or whatever, but we're you know, we're not messing with that anymore. You're on your own. So mm -hmm. that that's all this stuff means. And it sounds kind of harsh when you say that, uh, but you have to, and, and we'll get in some other, other articles later where they talk about breaks and, you know, is this a good idea and excluding people from the group. It sounds like Stalinism or something. It may sound like it, but it has nothing to do with it. You know, no. it, it just happens to have some of the same words. <laughs> Or you is like you're out of this group. Well, all, all of us do that. I mean, you have people you wouldn't invite to your home. You know, it's just that you don't maybe go out and make a public statement of it, but you would if you had to. <laughs> if people, <laughs> if people you didn't like kept showing up and hanging out, <laughs> I'd have a show. You know, you'd say, wait a minute. <laughs> and if people said, oh yeah, I'm his buddy, and uh, we agree on this, and I'm going to do this thing, and if it was something you detested, you're going to say, hey. I have nothing, <laughs> you know, they want to make a distinction, you know, and mm -hmm. the people outside can do whatever they want. It's just that they can't claim to be the, like, I'm a member of the SI or I'm an approved disciple of the SI. Or <laughs> That's what these things are going on. Uh, Mike Mellard.
Hi. Uh, am I am I on yet? You yeah. are on. <laughs> okay, good. I'll lower my hand. Um, I, I was just uh, as I was going over the text, I was remembering myself in my twenties and how um, I was influenced by SI and um, how I, um, I I think I think I remember uh, being. Um, what I would consider now that I'm uh, 78, uh, perhaps a bit more optimistic about the uh, ability of the proletariat to emancipate itself from wage slavery. And um, I think, um, I think that, that uh, it, it, it may have been the, um, I don't know, um, may have been a dis did it ever become a disappointment to the situationists that they actually i mean marx himself i mean i think he was pretty optimistic that if people read the political economy the cri critique of it that they'd figure out that they were fucking wage slaves and that they would emancipate themselves from this stupid fucking oppressive system uh, and create a classless you know democratic kind of situ situation among themselves but uh, they didn't, and then, and then various the, the various artistic groups that the uh, the SI critiques, like the surrealists and Dadaists and futurists and so forth, they are also trying to do this and approach it through, uh, I mean, uh, trigger the kind of radical subjectivity that's necessary to emancipate yourself from uh, from from a cultural angle, uh, and uh, and then they failed, and then SI tries tries to integrate it into everyday life, but uh, nobody in ev any, well, hardly anybody, <laughs> I tried. But I mean, some people, I mean, uh, most people didn't try. And maybe they got, maybe they got a little bit disappointed about the whole uh, strength of the, of the, uh, the ideological domination that Marx, you know, quips about how the ruling ideas of any, any era are always the, ideas of the ruling class. You just can't break through. People, people still think that they're, they're, uh, that wage slavery is freedom. They, st they still think there's such a thing as a fair oh, okay, day's okay, wage. Okay, so I, I, I think this is... Okay, never mind. But, but I get you your think? gist, yes. And yeah, yeah, okay. It, it's, it's, uh, you're not the first person to have said that. And of course, uh, every time, like, um, uh, I wrote uh, this text called The Joy of Revolution back in the 1990s. And um, uh, I mean, the whole book is about revolution and, the, you know, various possible tactics and what works and what doesn't work and so on. And at one point I said, well, is this likely? And uh, I said, well, it, you know, it's probably less likely than, I mean, it's less than a 50 50 thing i mean i was just saying but that's the only point time i go into it i i said but you know it's not like five percent i mean uh we don't know you know like yeah we've the, the system has proved to be uh in its clunky way you know uh able to weather a lot of stuff and then a certain point will come out Well, even the system can't last that way, but everybody's going to go down the tombs together. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's not an easy thing. Uh, it, and I don't think, um, I mean, if, if you're right after May 68 or something like that, or when Portugal is having their revolution, you know, a few years later and uh, all this, uh, Obviously, you would be more optimistic at that time because it looks like, wow, uh, 20 years ago, not much was happening. And now suddenly there's this. And I kind of felt that way in the 60s, just from the counterculture, which was not even on this same sort of terrain exactly. But I thought, you know, they kind of blended together. And I thought, like millions of other people, like, wow, this has changed so much in just a few years uh, who knows? I mean, uh, how fast things might go. And then it ends up just kind of grinding to a halt or going off to dead ends and stuff like that. So that happens. That's our situation. And uh, 
so a lot of people just kind of give up. I mean, it's sort of normal to do that. You know, if you if you have a kind of passable life, you can think, well, let's just uh, cultivate our own garden, so to speak, and, you know, forget it. Uh, I personally see also things like the Occupy movement or uh, various things crop up when nobody's even expecting them. And those are signs that uh, the same factors are in play now that were in play 50 years ago. And uh, in some regards, they're even more advanced. You know, uh, it's just so uh, I see it a little bit more a question of, uh, you know, the material is there in the sense of human frustration and human creativity that <laughs> fights back in various ways and all that. And as the situationists often articulated, they it said it, the question is sort of to unite this, not in one big mass party or something like that, which is irrelevant, but to bring these things together in some way. You know, there's all these things, but they're kind of isolated. And if they know what they're doing, they they win. So the only question is if the system can keep them isolated so that everybody thinks, oh, we're doing a little thing, but we're all isolated and the other people over there think the same thing <laughs> and so on. You know, so uh, I think there's uh, there's still a game to be played here. And, uh, you know, it's. Um, I think optimism or pessimism are sort of beside the point. You know, uh, it's good to recognize that it's not a pushover. But beyond that point, you just have to say, well, am I going to do something about it or am I not? And what you do about it may vary. Maybe you just decide to go write poems or so something or, you know, have a garden or, or whatever. Or you, uh, you know, there's different reactions that people might make. But uh, forget optimism and pessimism. That, that, that's kind of... That, you know, that's like, uh, that's not what's involved. You know, it's it's our lives to play with. And I consider this a very interesting game, <laughs> what we're talking about here. Uh, Dave Blake. Um, to add on to what Kent was, Kent was saying about <clears throat> the sort of Stalinist language that it feels like in some of his, the writings we've read this week, the... Um, I just wanted to point out that um, behind writings that are Stalinist, when they're actually from Stalinists, is the use of power. When Stalinists say in their communiques, you are excluded from this group, they mean probably you are out of a job, we may arrest you and send you to Siberia. All of these things are possible in communi communiques that use the same phrasing. But the important thing about the situation is two important things. One is they have no power, so they can't they can't tell you to do anything except they can say we admonish you for using our name, and they can't even can't even do you anything to you then. They're not going to sue. So it's important that these things be looked at in the context that the people who are saying them have no actual state power. The other thing I notice in this reading is I've been reading um, Ulysses simultaneously with this, and. Um, what Joyce does a lot of, and with, they mentioned that they draw on Joyce in the readings we read this time, um, uh, Joyce goes out and purposely uses strange forms of literature, mostly ecclesiastic, in order to uh, make fun of them and to show that you can use them to any purpose you want to. And the, the, there's an exemplariness to the, what their situationists are doing when they use things like questionnaires or even Stalinist communiques, that means we are playing with this stuff and you should feel free to play with it too. And they're trying to set an example of, of, the, of how you should look at all of these literature and, all, and also to undermine the powers that use this sort of talk. So there's a little bit of, of distancing and sarcasm behind everything they say that you must hear there or you're missing what they're doing at the time they're doing it. Good, thank you. I think we'll uh, move on to the next uh, uh, set of things. Uh, so let's see, I will.
Speaker uh, view. Yeah. Okay. I'm still. Yeah, I'm in speaker view and I'm spotlighted. Okay. So thanks. Those were a number of uh, good questions. So we're now going to move to, as I said, the, the second portion is three uh, fairly, uh, two of the articles are rather long and the other one is medium. It's kind of about the global society, the global system in different ways. And uh, the first one uh, has its elements of comic as well as macabre called the geopolitics of hibernation. And uh, it starts off with these, uh, with this um, uh, paragraph, the balance of terror there in quotes between two rival groups of states, obviously Russia and US, et cetera, the most visible basic aspect of global politics at the present moment is also a balance of resignation. Bear in mind, by the way, this would have come just uh, you know a year or two after the uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, where uh, there was at least the impression that we were minutes away from World War Three. Uh, uh, so, you know, this this was very in the in people's minds at that time. And a lot of people almost kind of expected a nuclear war, like, oh, that's just gonna happen. We got, so uh, they're saying this balance of terror is also a balance of resignation. The resignation of each antagonist to the permanence of the other and within their frontiers, the rec resignation of people to a fate that is so far out of their control that the very existence of the planet is par far from certain, hinging on the prudence and skill of inscrutable strategists. In reality, the two camps are not actually preparing for war, but for the indefinite preservation of this balance, which mirrors the internal stabilization of their power. It goes without saying that this will entail an enormous mobilization of resources, since it is imperative to continually escalate the spectacle of possible war. And then they go into this description of this kind of mass, almost mass hysteria of building bomb shelters. It's something that probably most people these days don't even know, but if, if you were around during that time, and, you know, there was this sense like, oh, the Russians are going to bomb us and vice versa. Uh, people actually spent thousands of dollars, you know, to build a little thing in their backyard, you know, that would be underground and uh, all this. Uh, and uh, uh, spent a lot of money. They spent a lot of money buying all the canned food that they would, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I mean, it was completely unrealistic, but, you know, there were all these businesses capitalizing on it and all the politicians from Kennedy on down were, oh, yeah, be patriotic, you know, help out, help, you know, let's finance the building of 50 million <laughs> of these things. Uh, so after this, the situation is go on. It is easy to see that these already widespread individual shelters could not possibly work, if only because of such gross technical oversights as the absence of an independent oxygen supply. <laughs> uh, and that even the most sophisticated collective shelters, like some huge thing they mention in Sweden or Switzerland, would offer over the, only the slightest possibility for survival if a thermonuclear war was actually accidentally unleashed. But here, as in every racket, quote, protection is only a pretext. You remember that Cotenia article from last time. The real purpose of the shelters is to test and therefore thereby reinforce people's submissiveness and to manipulate this submissiveness to the advantage of the ruling society. The shelters is the creation of a new consumable commodity in the society of abundance 
prove more than any previous commodity that people can be made to work to satisfy highly artificial needs, needs that most certainly, quote, remain needs without ever having been desires, unquote. In other words, it, you know, it's just a, a drummed up thing. You must have this or you don't care for your family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the next article, um, it's called The Bad Days Will End. The Bad Days Will End is the title of a 19th century song. It has nothing to do with this, but it's just, uh, they thought it would be make a nice title for this, and it does. Um, and that starts out, as the world of the spectacle extends its reign, it approaches the climax of its offensive, provoking new resistances everywhere. These resistances are very little known precisely because the reigning spectacle is designed to present an omnipresent hypnotic image of unanimous submission. But they do exist and are spreading. And then they give examples of, you know, youth revolts, various things like this kind of under the radar. And then they go on just as the first organization of the classical proletariat was preceded during the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th by a period of isolated so-called criminal acts in, aimed at destroying the machines of production that were depriving people of their work. This was the original, uh, uh, what should we call it? Um, Leadites. We are presently witnessing the first appearance of a wave of vandalism against the machines of consumption that are just as certainly depriving us of our life. In both cases, the significance obviously does not lie in the destruction itself, this is very important, but in the rebelliousness which could potentially develop into a positive project going to the point of reconverting the machines in a way that increases people's real power over their lives. Uh, so this is a, a great, you know, the situation is played around with, uh, I mean, in certain contexts, they uh, defend vandalism, for example, when the Watts people rioted, rioted you know, they said, we're not going to say they shouldn't have done this or they were breaking the law or how dare they hurt that store or, or whatever. You know, they said this is completely logical response to the lives they, they live. But unlike some people who sort of read that simplistically, that doesn't mean that they say the way to change this society is to go break store windows and, you know, burn down a store or something. Not at all. They're just saying that when people do it, okay, we defend that. We ex we're going to explain why they did that, you know. And if you understand why they did that, then you may better understand what you could do instead. You know, in other words, uh, to go back even to the original Luddites that they're comparing from a century earlier. Uh, it's understandable that if you're you're thrown out of work because some new machine is taking, you know, doing what you can do a hundred times better, and you have no alternative, it makes sense. Of course, you would go and tear down the machine, and that way you'll get to work a few more years and get your. Uh, it's it's logical, but ultimately, that's not the way to <laughs> the the solution to that obviously is that you would want machines that would help you know that wouldn't throw you out of work because of the, you had a different kind of an economy or a non-economy so to speak and the same way they're not saying that this current vandalism against cars or shop windows or whatever it might be is the way to go but they're saying this is what this society is giving us and it's going to keep happening you know, if something different is not done. But the idea is that that force that is there, that impetus could be turned into another direction that was more creative. 
not creative in making this a nice society within the current context, but something that would have new uses for the technological possibilities. And this will come up later. Um, so uh, then they uh, say, leaving aside the havoc perpetrated by groups of adolescents, we can point out a few examples of actions by workers that are in a large part incomprehensible from the classical protests and demands perspective. And then they give some really fascinating examples of, you know, like workers trashing cars. And it turns out it's some of it's their own cars <laughs> or, yeah, you know, things that might seem completely illogical, but you can understand, you know, like it's kind of a reaction against commuter time or whatever it may be. And they make a lot of other similar points there. So then after going through there, showing these kind of hidden responses that we don't hear very much about, they say, the assault of the first workers movement against the whole organization of the old world came to an end long ago and nothing can bring it back to life. It failed. So they're talking about the movement, say, since the French Revolution or so uh, into the 19th century, uh, into the early 20th century. And, uh, you know, it was a strong movement. It had things like the Paris Commune and other revolutions. It had like the two revolutions in Russia. You know, there were a number of revolutions around this thing, but the result is that it failed. None of them really succeeded in anything significant beyond just, you know, providing a little bit more bandage of welfare or something like that, which was not what those movements originally had in mind. And so uh, they continue, it, namely that old workers movement, certainly achieved immense results, but not the ones it had originally intended. The classical workers movement must be re-examined without any illusions, particularly without any illusions regarding its various political and pseudo-theoretical errors, because all they have inherited is its failure. The apparent successes of this movement are actually its fundamental failures. For example, reformism or the establishment of a state bureaucracy, like in Russia. While its failures, for example, the Paris Commune or the 1934 Asturian Revolt, are its most promising successes so far for us and for the future. This movement must be pre precisely delineated in time. The classical workers movement can be considered to have begun a couple decades before the official formation of the first international with the first link up of communist groups of several countries that Marx and his friends organized from Brussels in 1845. And it was completely finished after the defeat of the Spanish revolution that is, after the Barcelona May Days of 1937. So they are very precise, and that actually is pretty exact, but they're, they're making a point of that. We need to rediscover the whole truth of this period and to re-examine all the oppositions between revolutionaries and all the neglected possibilities without, without any longer being impressed by the fact that some won out over others and dominated the movement. For we now know that the movement within which they were successful was an overall failure. And the last of these three articles is actually the most humongous one. It's, uh, it's longer and it goes into a whole bunch of different things. So I, I can only touch on a few of them. Is ideologies, classes, and the domination of nature. Uh, the advances in production and in constantly improving technological potentials are proceeding even faster than 19th century communism predicted. But we have remained at a stage of over-equipped prehistory. Prehistory is like uh, when Marx and Engels talk, uh, in order to make a point about the future revolutionary society they're aiming at, uh, they would say that's when real human history starts. 
everything leading up to that has just been sort of a bumbling in the dark you know when humans didn't know what they were doing and were just sort of groping and going at heart so uh that the previous part of history is just human prehistory everything up to the communist society the revolution so a century of revolutionary attempts has failed human life has not been rationalized and impassioned the project of a classless society has yet to be achieved we find ourselves caught up in an endless expansion of material means that continues to serve fundamentally static interests it's going nowhere and notoriously obsolete values uh page or two later every day alienated people are shown or informed about new successes they have obtained successes for which they have no use this does not mean that these advances in material development are bad or uninteresting they could be turned to good use in real life but only along with everything else underlined the whole point is like if you just make a technological change but you keep the economy you keep the you know the ideologies and religions and all this other stuff uh the technology is going to be used to reinforce those things um so then to continue the victories of our day belong to star hyphen specialists Gagarin, the uh, Russian astronaut, Gagarin's exploit shows that man can survive farther out in space under increasingly unfavorable conditions. But just as is the case when medicine and biochemistry enable a prolonged survival in time, this quantitative extension of survival is in no way linked to a qualitative improvement of life. You can survive farther away and longer, but never live more. And then jumping ahead, we believe that the role of theorists, a role which is indispensable, but which must not be dominant, is to provide information and conceptual tools that can shed light on people's hidden desires and on the social crisis they are experiencing, to clarify things and show how they fit together to make the new proletariat aware of the new poverty that must be named and described. We are presently witnessing a reshuffling of the cards of class struggle, a struggle which has certainly not disappeared, but whose lines of battle have been somewhat altered from the old schema. In the context of the reality presently beginning to take shape, we may, be, we may consider as proletarians all people who have no possibility of altering the social space-time that the society allots to them, regardless of variations in their degree of affluence or chance, chances for promotion. The rulers are those who organize this space-time, or who at least have a significant margin of personal choice, even stemming, for example, from a significant survival of older forms of private property. A revolutionary movement is a movement that radically changes the organization of this space-time and the very matter of deciding on its ongoing reorganization, as opposed to merely changing the legal forms of property or the social origin of the rulers. So I think I'll stop there. And uh, for our second Q&A, And uh, Danny, I haven't asked you if anything has been showing up in the chat. We've we had uh, uh, in the way we had a couple questions. things earlier. Um, well, what are you? Uh, here's here's deal one now. Right now. Yeah. Which other revolutions from the past did the SI find worth studying? Well, let's see. You know, there's. Um, I think it's obvious that the 1848 revolutions and the French Revolution, certain aspects it, uh, of it, 
uh, were certainly of interest. The Russian Revolution of 1905, which is when Soviets or workers' councils were first created. Uh, the 1917 revolution in Russia, before it was taken over by the Bolsheviks, and also in Russia, they noted that the Kronstadt Revolt in 1921 and the Makhno Peasant Revolt and kind of anarcho peasant revolt in the Ukraine in that same period were both, you know, those two things against the Bolsheviks had some very uh, exemplary features. Then they have. Uh, we will see in some later articles that they look at the uh, other things coming out of World War I. There was a German revolution and somewhat of an Italian revolution coming in the immediate aftermath of World War I, uh, both of which had some gesturings towards workers' councils and things like that. Uh, then in in Spain, we they mentioned that Asturian revolt of 1934, which they are not exaggerating. That was a unbelievable revolution. It, it only lasted like a few weeks, uh, but it was just like no compromise, you know. And uh, uh, like it ended up with thousands of these miners in Asturian getting killed and tortured, and tens of thousands of them being arrested. Uh, and then obviously the Spanish Revolution in 1936, 37, as they note that 37 cutoff, they figure by May 1937, the Stalinists and their allies had more or less taken over. So of course you still had a civil war against Franco that went on a couple more years, but they're saying the real revolution was like that one year from 36 to 37. And then they they mentioned uh, the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 is an obvious one. And there were some other uh, revolutions uh, in East Europe, not revolutions, but revolts in Poland and East, East Berlin and so on. And they also mentioned, but more briefly, the Mexican Revolution, 1910 to 20, which included a lot of different aspects but certainly, uh, you know, it contained, uh, you know, a lot of uh, exciting, exemplary, poetic features, as the we will get to in the uh, in, in our the, the next Q and A part. So, um, and as time went on, of course, there were more things. Portugal, <laughs> nineteen seventy four, and on and on. Uh, Lee. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the idea of the domination of nature uh, has increasingly come under attack, you know, since in the last 50 or more years, um, you know, in the dialectic of enlightenment, people like Horkheimer or Adorno or other other people, Frankfurt School or, or um, Carolyn Merchant and the death of nature, uh, it's it's um it's been pointed out that this idea ever since um uh what's his name um some of the key enlightenment thinkers i can't think of this guy's name but one of the guy who is who is um particularly promoting like experimental science uh in england francis bacon um you know he the, the metaphor of dominating nature And it and and and, the, and some pretty horrible, you know, metaphors of like penetrating nature secrets and um, you know raping and all this stuff. Um, and and humans and nature are not separate. And and the Frankfurt School people were especially big on this idea that like when when you when you're going for like when when they're this, in this metaphor of dominating nature no. is is uh, included. It encompasses this kind of domination of our own inner nature. In a kind, of, anyway. Um, yeah. I, and I'm just wondering. I mean, I, there weren't there wasn't that much talk about you know criticizing the this idea. I think when the situationists wrote this, but there was a little bit apparently from Castoriadis. They mentioned Cardan in this. 
Yeah. And I'm just wondering, like, how much are they really doubling down on this? Oh, yeah. Uh, Lee, did, did they, it, this, this or did, is or did they just it, not really think this through that much? Yeah. Uh, it's it's good that you bring this up, and obviously people will do it. I personally think that this is a big non-issue. And the reason I think it's a big non-issue, I think that, that uh, you know, terminology, yeah, you can say, okay, this reflects some masculine thing, or it reflects a hierarchical thing or something like that. But look, anybody in practice, you know, that leaving aside the sort of mad scientist type of person or something something like like this and uh is no uh, you know all that all they really mean is that we are developing things such that if a storm comes we don't die because we know how to build a shelter <laughs> or we'd say uh, you know this is all that amounts to when uh it, it's true we can look back and say, well, that's kind of a crude way of putting it. Well, okay. So, <laughs> uh, you know, do you, you know, when the situationists are referring to, uh, you know, they're taking that like from Marx and Hegel and, you know, back to the Enlightenment and all that, just as a thing like, like saying, well, look, we're not going to pussyfoot about this. We are talking about saying, like, so we're not at the mercy of this thing. It means that we do things with nature so that, you know, when lightning strikes you know we've got a lightning rod there or when when famine strikes we've developed new kinds of you know foods or something you know what wh whatever the things may be that's all that means now we have we you and i and everybody now like if we were ever in a situation uh post-revolutionary so to speak where we could deal with that of course th th things would still be debated people would be saying, well, should we leave this whole forest just as it is, or should we combine it with parks? Or, <laughs> you know, there would be debates about just where we draw the line, but nobody's saying, you know, like they might have said, you know, two centuries ago or something, let's just make the whole world a like a parking lot so we don't have to do any weeding in yours <laughs> you know they're they're not having some mad thing you know where you're just totally cut off because it's totally uh, i mean the situation debor and these people knew about ecology they knew these things are interrelated uh even back in like the early 70s or late 60s they were talk they were talking about these things like well <laughs> what happens if you've polluted so much that <laughs> you know Da, da, da. they're aware of these interrelations and so uh like i say we can debate uh and it's a legit debate like if it was in our control just like when they're talking about what would they do with paris we could say well gosh i'd like to leave uh let's see we'll leave the amazon forest like it is but this other yeah you know we would decide like where do we draw the line and maybe we invent new combinations of things i kind of like that idea but but that's just one notion you know where you have stuff that it kind of segues into one other you know we are the dominant species here and that's not going to change unless we destroy ourselves so uh it, it's just a question like where do we you know, we have the capacity to do just any pretty much anything that we want, including to destroy everything, uh, totally. Uh, but you know, it's kind of up to us. Like, well, we we want to phase out. I mean, I don't know. You know, phase out meat eating or something, or have different. Yeah, you know, people would. That's that's the kind of thing that people could realistically debate and say no we want to do this i don't want to be cruel to animals or we would you know and people would say well okay but are you going to do that at the cost of x number of people dying you know and then you have to say okay we'll have some <laughs> you know things here uh all that stuff is up in play and the situationists are never saying a thing about that because it's obvious you know, their their whole point is that right now, uh, our so-called domination of nature is leading to stuff like 
possible nuclear war or destroying the ocean or stuff like that. And a different kind of, quote, domination of nature could lead to a very nice ecological society of all sorts of different things. And uh, okay. you know, just, just not to fetishize the term, I, like if I was writing a leaflet now, I wouldn't use the phrase domination of nature just because I would know yeah, people are going to get the wrong idea, you know. Yeah, okay. I, I have a very annoying, unstable uh, internet connection, so oh. I missed about half of what you're saying oh. there, but I get you just... All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, any other uh, questions? Uh, ha digital hands or chat? From earlier, there was a somewhat related question. Do you think the analysis of contemporary movements of the time was applied uniformly? Like in hindsight, was the critique applied consistently? Um, well, I would want to know what, what uh, you know, are they thinking about something like <laughs> maybe that the SIA praised Watts and didn't praise something else that they should? I, I, uh, I think what the SI was always doing was they were looking for the most strategic thing. So, uh, you know, if something like Watts happened, they're saying, hey, this is not just an interesting riot. This happened in the middle of the United States. You know, the, you know, right next to uh, the world's capital of spectacle capital, uh, Hollywood. <laughs> And this is this advanced society and da da da. So it's very interesting from that regard, as well as whatever may have been the inherent thing of the riot, where somebody might have rioted someplace else even more violently or something, but it, it didn't, you know, it was kind of business as usual. <laughs> so I think they're picking things that they think have some significance. Like if they write about China and the, the Cultural Revolution, it's because they think it is symptomatic of the contradictions of the Stalinist kind of societies. And if they write about Vietnam and the Arab-Israel War, which is right back with us today, uh, they're writing because these, these are examples of, uh, for one thing, the complete stupidity of wars and the fact that they're continuing to go on uh, says something about the society. And then you can also look at the particulars and say, well, this war is partly caused because that revolution failed. <laughs> and so da da da. You know, they, uh, they're looking at things that they can draw some useful conclusions from. And um, let's see here. So that's uh, Sid Settler. You raised your hand, or did you change your mind? No, I'm here. Okay. Um. So, uh, something sort of sticks in my um somewhere, uh, <laughs> uh, about the word uh, or about the the concept failure in relation like what that section you read ken about the various uh or discussed about certain things were failures certain revolutionary movements or moments were like failures um which may be true on the other hand uh, i sort of rather think of it and i'm sort of wondering if the uh if if the situation is people thought perhaps thought I kind of prefer to think of it not as failures, although, you know, ultimately maybe yes, but I prefer to think of them as successes that were limited in time. You know, they were successes up yeah. until the point where they weren't successful anymore. Uh -huh. And um, I, it may be like a small point and, you know, like, a, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, my brain it's the, the language you know the language uh, you know i'm trying to express but it's sort of i think there's like a qualitative difference between saying something's a failure and saying something you, you know it almost gives it more power 
to say, well, it did succeed, you know, but it didn't, but we, it's not like the end of things. It's just like the beginning of something. And so why not think of those things not as failures? I'm not, I'm not sure if they, they thought of them as failures because, I mean, semantics is the word I was thinking of. Uh -huh. It's just a matter of semantics, you know, that I'm speaking of now, or do they really feel these were failures or, you know, um, couldn't, could I don't know, maybe it's just me. Couldn't one think of them as successes? Sure, you know? sure, sure, you, you could. Uh, and this, this uh, but believe me, they were very conscious of this thing. Uh, and if they decided to say, this is a failure, they did it for a good reason. And in another context, they might say, okay. And in fact, sometimes in the same sentence, they say, it did achieve, you know, it was very successful, you know, but look at what the success was. It, like if you talk about the Russian Revolution being a success, you could say it was so successful that it utterly destroyed the possibility of revolution in the 20th century. Is that a success? You know, uh, by mm. by making revolution seem to be not very different than the Nazis. <laughs> uh, and so you could say, oh, gosh, but yeah, but the peasants were eating better or some kind of crap. Like <laughs> you know, for one thing, there's a question, maybe they weren't in many cases, they were dying. But even if they were, you know, this is pretty lame. I mean, look, come on, the masses condition under Hitler was probably better than it was in the 20s. He got things more organized. You wouldn't say, well, isn't that a partial success? <laughs> you would say that's ridiculous. That was not, yeah, By, that uh, uh, the reason yeah. it, it succeeded is, I, I mean, Hitler wouldn't have succeeded if he had everybody starving to death. Of course, he's going to make people, you know, give better food and, you know, make sure there's not so much unemployment and make sure people feel good about themselves, <laughs> all that kind of thing, uh, you, you know, and the point is, if you looked at that, you wouldn't dream of saying that's a success, isn't it? You would say that's right. A no, I'm not referring to the like Hitler or things like that. I'm I'm kind of referring to sort of revolutionary moments, for example, like Kronstadt, which I don't know very much about, but you know, just sort of the a little bit. Um, you know, that yeah, they were crushed and it didn't expand and it didn't, you know, end in a classless society, but for as long as it lasted, which I don't know how long that was, it, it was radical, you know. It yeah, was oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think you're going off on the wrong point here because they were fervently in favor of that. They are not saying, oh, Kronstadt failed, da, da, da. I mean, of course, Kronstadt did fail. It, it was crushed. <laughs> uh, but what they're talking about, uh, Kronstadt would have been one of those things. Re remember when they're talking about... Um, um, like uh, to go back to the quote, the apparent successes of this movement are actually its fundamental failures. And they give examples, reformism or the establishment of a state bureaucracy, like in Russia. Mm -hmm. Reformism would be like New Deal or you know things like that, uh, 40 hour week. Uh, well, it's failures, the Paris Commune, or the 1934 Asturian Revolt, I mean, they certainly failed, but they were crushed violently, are its most promising successes so far hmm. for us and for the future. So they would say the identical thing about Kronstadt. They're just, for the rhetoric, they're just picking two examples. Uh, elsewhere, you know, they do mention Kronstadt and they mention Matno and various uh, others. And they're mentioning these as things that can still inspire us because we can look at those and say, how did those Kronstadt sailors do this? Where did they come from? How did they organize? How did they arm themselves? Could they have won? Could they have, uh, you know, what, whatever they did, and maybe we can say, oh, they made a mistake here or something, but strategically or something like that. Uh, maybe the Paris Commune could have done something different. You know, people say, oh, if they'd only seized the bank, they would have had the nuts around, you know, the whole bourgeoisie of France or something, uh, you yeah, know. So, but... mm -hmm. Yeah, similar to uh, what I recall reading, I forget the name of the pamphlet, but um, the one about 68 in Paris, where yeah. 
is you know similar uh, right if if they had done this such, yeah. and, such and such so anyway the, the point is that those kind of things uh, when they talk about being failures in in this context they're saying a bunch of stuff happened and some of it succeeded and the stuff that seemed to succeed like wow that's a new president or or something you know are a sign of its failure and the stuff that was just crushed you know and you say well forget about that it says that's still a success because the fact that the parisians were able to organize that the fact that the asturian miners were able to organize this even though they they hardly even had any weapons they're called the dinamiteros because they used dynamite sticks of dynamite as their weapons because they oh. didn't have any guns <laughs> you know and yet you know they had this tremendous thing you know in this little region you know for several weeks and then totally crushed but we can look at that and say, man, they didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> it's just, you know, that by the time they did it, they were isolated. And, you know, it's it's hard to imagine how they could have succeeded. But they certainly didn't leave a bad example <laughs> for the future. Whereas all the people compromising with parliamentary this or that and then signing up for World War I when it happened in the name of Patriot, uh, you know, all that stuff that gave examples of exactly not what not to do. So, uh, yeah, but by by saying it's a failure, it's all also this. Some of this is just rhetoric. You know, it's a stronger way of saying, look, this this whole movement was a failure. And then they they even explicitly say it did accomplish a lot of things. Yeah. But the things that accomplished, you know, were sort of things that just sort of reinforce the existing system. Mm. you know by patching it up so they're not saying that it was not worthwhile to work for the eight hour day they never say anything like that absolutely some so-called situ or anarchist people will say things like that oh that's just reformism that's bullshit the situation has never said that uh you know in general like if there were struggles they were on the side of the struggle but what they weren't on the side of was just signing up for some political group that says we're the we're leading our, our thing for blah 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 and say okay now we get to have to support Castro or we have to support the Viet Cong or we have to support Obama or yeah you know <laughs> whoever seems to be you know doing this partial success thing you know they're they're saying well yeah that that stuff goes without saying, you know, that of course you're going to struggle for those things. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's just that you have to be aware that if you're struggling for those things in isolation, like you're only struggling for the eight hour day and not struggling, say, for equality of women, there's going to be some... <laughs> friction there yeah you, you know you're you're being inconsistent or you're struggling for an eight hour a day but you still want to keep uh, segregated unions mm. you know i, I mean there's yeah. of, so i mean those are kind of glaringly obvious things mm -hmm. uh, that you would say uh so if a situationist were writing a leaflet about those kinds of things they would say hey folks <laughs> you can't do this and yet what try to hold on to this other you know male supremacy thing over here or white supremacy over here or say uh you know because the logic of it is that you have to do the whole package you know it doesn't mean that you do everything at once but you at least have to sort of open things up you know so that when people look at the struggle the struggle looks like a an efflorescence of freedom things, not just one little slogan, you know, we want this, forget everything yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, Good. Judy. Okay. Um well excuse me if if this sounds kind of um naive, because a lot of this uh, just just say these... your just say your question. We're running. Okay. A I don't understand. I sort of agree with um, 
what Sid was saying about calling things successes or failures, because, you know, like I've often said, you know, about the revolutions, well, they were horrible, but they did improve people's lives for maybe a brief point, a period of time or whatever, which you seem to dispute. But I, I do think they, some of these revolutions like the Maoists and the Russians did change did change society for a while. And I don't know why the situation is, I don't understand why they have such arrogance when in fact their movement did nothing that I can see that ever changed any worker's life in the slightest. Well, what do you expect? They're like 10 people. Well, I don't know, but why are they so arrogant about all these movements that actually messy and brutal as they were moved well, do you th do you, things do, a little do you th bit. Do you think Nazism was okay? No, we're not talking about well, Nazism. Okay, I, I, yeah, but a lot of these things were not that different. Mao and Stalin both killed more people than Hitler did. Most of them peasants and stuff like that. It's not like... Uh, you know, these are these are not uh, just nice, uh, you know. Uh, anyway, I don't want to go into so, uh, But you get my gist, right? I, I, I get, I, yes, I, I get your gist, but I don't agree with it. Uh, uh, the, uh, you're not helping anybody if you pat them on the back and say, oh, that was very good when they didn't do very well <laughs> uh and let alone when the millions of people's lives are at stake in the future like are we going to do that again oh well in mao they did well in china they did this and da, da, da. that's uh i mean if there's any lessons to be learned it's that that's the last thing to do you know it was just an utter disaster i mean it it's just if you realize you would be horrified at how like tens of millions of people died in china because mao had a bright idea oh we can do this and you know have you know iron factories in everybody's backyards and stuff like this yeah you know and and um I don't think it was that simple. I think it, it, I well, think the it, envelope it, it, moved it, it, in China. It was. It was. <laughs> Believe me. Okay, I, I want to move on to our last thing because we're uh, running over a little bit here. Um, uh, the avant-garde of presence is this article um, where they're kind of playing off a um, somebody who was talking about the avant-garde of absence. And uh, so they they mention in this uh, that uh, as the situationists have become a little bit more well-known, this is kind of getting towards the mid-60s, early 60s, uh, some people uh, are, uh, it says our adversaries are, forced to disguise themselves as situationists. And they give the one type of example of the Nashists, who they say proclaim themselves situationists without having any idea what they're talking about. And the inverse kind of thing, where people who decide to adopt a few situationist ideas minus the situationists and without mentioning the SI. And they're not objecting to the fact that they don't get credit for this or that. They're just pointing out that people don't mention the SI in that context because it would make them look silly. Like you're, you've been ignoring these people for years and saying they're of no importance. And now you're sneakily adopting one of their ideas and trying to make a killing on it. And they give an example of uh, the development of happenings particularly in New York, uh, but there were some similar things going on in Europe. And they point out what may have uh, been fairly obvious when we were talking about situations in the previous meetings, uh, that the happening sounds kind of like a situation. You know, you're creating stuff and, you know, you're setting aside some, some terrain to uh, do these things. It, it's, it's like you're doing stuff like you would create a party or 
uh, I mean, like a surprise party or something like that. And they're pointing, so they go ahead to point the limitations of the happenings as being, uh, this is still kind of arty and uh, it has nothing really to do with changing the society. It's it's kind of, you know, it's kind of an ambiguous thing there. It's You could say that this is sort of on the far fringes of cultural radicality that remains still within the system. And the SI's notion of situation is something uh, that would, by its very nature, go beyond the system. It's, it's something that you can't pigeonhole. Um, so then I'm going to go to All the King's Men, which is this very poetic and uh, 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 in the good sense of the term article about language and poetry in particular. And they, uh, to understand what they mean by poetry, they, they say, basically, they're saying, we're not talking about people that write a little thing and this is a poem. Uh, what we're talking about is what people think of as uh, the essence of poetry. You know, there's something kind of magical about it. You know, like when we say the poetry of that speech, it doesn't mean that the speech was a poem, but it was like that it had some uh, vital, lively plays with language, you know, and they're saying what we mean by poetry is when that extends into everyday life. And we're not interested in writing different poems or in, you know, preserving the old poems or something like this. Uh, uh, they say, what is poetry if not the revolutionary movement of language, inseparable as such from the revolutionary moments of history and from the history of personal life? Rediscovering poetry may merge with reinventing revolution, as has been demonstrated by certain phrase, phases of the Mexican, Cuban, and Congolese revolutions. Out, uh, and uh, it means nothing less than simultaneously and inseparably creating events in their languages, in their language. As long as it lasts, it, its demands admit of no compromise. It brings back into play all the unsettled debts of history. Fourier, the French uh, utopian, Pancho Villa, the Mexican insurgent, Lotreomol, the pre-surrealist guy, and the Dina Materos of the Asturias, whose successors are now inventing new forms of strikes, this was in the early 60s. They were striking against uh, Franco, the Franco regime. The sailors of Kronstadt and Kiel, that was a German mutiny place. And all those around the world who, with us or without us, are preparing to fight for the long revolution are equally the emissaries of the new poetry. And here just went from the last, the questionnaire from the Center for Socio-Experimental Art, I think that recoups a lot of stuff that we've already talked about. But uh, just the first question, why are the masses not concerned with art? Why does art remain the privilege of certain educated sectors of the bourgeois class? Their answer is, in part, the masses, i.e. the non-ruling classes, have no reason to feel concerned with any aspects of a culture or an organization of social life that have not only been developed without their participation or their control, but that have in fact been deliberately designed to prevent such participation and control. They are concerned, illusorily, they're talking about the masses, only with the byproducts specifically produced for their consumption. The diverse forms of spectacular publicity and propaganda in favor of various products or role models, etc. So uh, we can now have a brief Q&A about those last topics or anything that's remaining, but I think focus on that, uh, the artistic and linguistic stuff if possible. Uh, uh, Mike Ballard. Hi. Uh, 
Um, I, when I read that, I thought um, they, um, I, it, again, I think, I think if, if we were actually able to establish a classless democratic society, association of free producers, all that, <clears throat> I don't, I, I think that um, it, it's, well, it seems to me that the, the, uh, uh, the immense majority of people are never going to be uh, uh, into, uh, you know, making uh, very, very creative art. And um, that... Uh, well, they they that, don't have to be. Remember, we're, uh, the situations are not, they don't really give a shit about art. They're saying that this has been a terrain where specialists can do this. I, I, I understand that. I understand that because that because the the specialists are the are parts of the, are part of the ruling class uh, that uh, that dominate things uh, and and the art is uh, something separate from everybody from uh, everyday life and uh, so what they what I, I understand them to want to do is to make everyday life into a creative art. Uh, and that uh, I think uh, I think that you know I think if if we actually did use machinery to lessen the labor time and we had a lot a lot of leisure time, that uh, a lot of people would probably get into painting, poetry, and what have you. But you know I think most people are would be satisfied with just playing, like yeah. even playing games. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's all kinds. Uh, I have a book, Mike, uh, I mean, a, a piece called The Joy of Revolution. It would make a small book. It's it's in my book, Public Secrets. And in that, I have a, a chapter, about 20 pages, where I talk about after the revolution, basically what, and I go into all these things, like uh, not only how would you do without money or what kind mm. of technologies, how would you, uh, you know, what would you do if, you know, there were still some, somebody raped somebody, how would you handle that and, and all that. And I go into all these things about, you know, the, the energy that now goes into work or in, to, in trying to escape work uh, through criminality or various other, other things. Uh, you know, uh, people would come up with more creative things, but I said, it doesn't really matter even if some people don't. I mean, if somebody wants to just hang out, you know, and read all the time or or uh, go hiking all the time or go bird watching or something, it doesn't really matter because there would be such an abundance of talents and creativities floating around that somebody you know the needs would get filled up and then people would yeah you know who knows i mean probably anything that we can imagine would just be look if, if they looked back at us they would say oh man what a pitiful imagination they had you know of course we could do a hundred times more different things than they're doing they're talking about would somebody paint a picture well like well duh yeah <laughs> you know i i mean there's just all kinds of things that people could do have different kinds of parties different kinds of cuisines different kinds of relationships different kinds mm -hmm. of gardening different kinds of ecology different kinds of uh you know mystical things diff uh, you know who know who knows what they be doing and th the whole point is that we just eliminate this sort of uh materialistic blackmail you know where you have to spend half of your life paying the rent you know so to speak or i i totally agree and i i i think i've i've skimmed joy of revolution and i i, I agree with all your points uh, that that uh, but what i was reflecting on was when i was reading the situationists the, back in the 60s, yeah. uh, I was thinking that maybe they had a hope that there would be this uh, uh, springboard of great, great uh, burst of creativity that would that would come out of the uh, like like I said, you know, art wouldn't would no longer be a separate category. It, everyday yeah, life. You, would be you, work you paint your wall in your house, or you you know, there's all kinds of different you know. To some extent, <laughs> these things are already happening. I mean, during the yeah. hippie thing in the 60s, 
you know, uh, nobody was a painter, but when you went in their house, they painted the whole wall and the ceiling. And, you know, I they, did that. They, all these crafts were just, <laughs> you know, and a lot of, I mean, not that it, it was nothing monumental, but, you know, it was just like, they were just doing yeah. that, you know, just like if you like music, you're diddling away on the guitar or so, something. Totally. Uh, I, yes, I, I agree. Uh, uh, I agree. Yeah. Uh, Ed Matthews? Yeah, uh, you can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have to admit, um, this one, this is one of my favorite essays uh, by DeBall, uh, because my interest in language, he really kind of hones in on one of the uh, perhaps one of the easiest things that we can do, and this is to Judy's point, uh, in trying to think in hindsight what the, what the SI have given us. Well, at the very least, they've given us a, an awareness of what language is. And if De Boer is right, that language has become increasingly functional, informational, it's a language of manufacturing and advertising, the awareness of words, the awareness that the, the way in which we express ourselves is the way in which you we uniquely try to you know speak about who we are, right? Rather than using someone else's words uh, that we were getting from advertising, from cinema, from TV, now uh, to just stop for a moment and just think, what's the best way to describe something? That to me can be a situationist moment to to break free and break away from you know a simple explanation of what you saw is like it was just like a movie. Well, what does that even mean? <laughs> you know, it was just like a movie. That, that's great. Can you give it to me in other kinds of words? So for me, to to think of that revolution of everyday life, for me, it starts with language. It starts me, it starts with expressing oneself. And if Heidegger is right that we dwell in language, and that's where we have our being, um, then why not start there? Doesn't cost anything except maybe thinking, just to reflect for a moment. And rather than having that that nanosecond space between a thought and the word that expresses it. And not having advertising co-op that nanosecond, it's ours. It's ours to consider what is the correct word? What is the most appropriate word to describe the thought that I'm having? Uh -huh. This essay defines that, yeah. in, at least in my I mean, mind, I have to say, well. leaving aside, the, I mean, the situationists, at least some of them, were beautiful artists. I mean, DeBoer, if you want to look at it this way, DeBoer was one of the greatest artists of the 20th century hands down no question mm -hmm. he's done so you know it's just that uh he really part of the reason he was is that he didn't care about that kind of thing uh he he used these words in such a way that they really were magical not that they had nice sounding images that you would think of although that might be a side effect but because they had an impact they meant mm -hmm. you know and you know, Rambo wanted to do something with words, you know, that would change the world. Well, De Boer did that, you know, yeah. and some of the other situation is to some degree or other, they had that same sparkle, you know, and so uh, you'll see that with Van Gem and with many, many of the others, they come up with these uh, slogans and these things. And it's not because they're good writers or they're good at language or something. It's that they were into this project that was like this kind of magical project, you know, and they even use sort of magical words to talk about it. We were seeking the Northwest Passage and the Holy Grail and, you know, all, all, all these kind of things. And uh, so uh, they end up writing these things that are far better writing than most writers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to say nothing about the fact that they're more accurate. I want to move on, though. Uh, uh, who is Ann? Uh, I, I don't know what your name is. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, my question is about the third section in the questionnaire on art and society, where they're talking about, the question is about if they lived in a different society, their role would be different. Right. And I'm wondering if the situationists imagined like, like a so-called maybe advanced Western country of the United right. States backsliding into more like a repressive society as I mean like we can see examples in the United States of like kind of like when they're talking about more archaic forms of domination and I wonder if they thought or talked more about like the point at which maybe like an artist's role in their mind would change in like a backsliding like western or advanced country uh well uh they do give I think three different examples 
they give the example, uh, one that I, I know is if they were in a Stalinist society, uh, they said, well, of course, in that case, we would be in favor of the most freedom <laughs> that we could find for artistic things, you know, because otherwise you couldn't do anything. You're going to get arrested and, and so on. So you'd have to adjust your <laughs> practice according to that. If you were in a society like Franco's Spain, that's not quite as bad because you can get away with a lot of stuff there as long as you're not criticizing Franco and uh, stuff like that. But you would still have to watch your step like it might have an element of puritanicalism that other societies wouldn't. If you're in a but if you're in a totally modern society where not just like the United States, but France, although not as modern, is culturally certainly as modern or more than, than as the United States. And that's where they are. And so when they're in that situation, uh, they have a rather uh, low estimate of art. You know, like they don't feel an urge to put their... Uh, express themselves in this kind of thing because they've seen it all you know france has had that and it's already it's already gone through dadaism and surrealism stuff like that you know so uh, going back to painting pictures like uh renoir or something like that is not a issue you know that I mean, you do that you, you know that's just like uh what rich people do who have nothing else to do oh i'm gonna paint like Renoir. <laughs> you know it, it's it's lost its meaning that it might have had 200 years ago uh so i think that's why being in paris in particular they're particularly critical about ar artists the illusions of that but if they put themselves in you know like in a third world country well yeah, that's a little different, you know, then maybe you want to do something that could contribute toward fighting co colonialism, which would be kind of a meaningless thing to do in the advanced countries, because it's not really an issue there. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers what you're talking about. Uh, we are getting towards the end here, maybe time for one or two more questions, if there are any. Danny, were there any other interesting things in the uh, chat? Lots of commentary, but no questions. Okay, fine. I'll I'll be looking at the, you know, uh, I'll be saving the chat. I think that you, uh, you all may may be able to save the chat. I think you can go in the chat and just select all and copy it. But there may be even something where you can save the chat. I'm not sure. But anyway, if, if you don't know how to do that, you know, you can check if there were any links there or something. So um, I think that this is a good time to wind up. It's about two, five minutes to go. So I thank you. I, I think we've had, a, uh, you know, basically pretty good questions. I mean, even the Spirited. questions. Pardon me? Spirited conversation. Spirited conversation. Um, and... Um, I, I think, um, uh, you know, so I think as we, the farther we get along here, the easier this is going to be uh, as far as understanding things, because here we're seeing them develop. And some of, I know some of you are somewhat new to this, others maybe not so much. Uh, but as we go forward into the next, now the next one is an exception, but uh, the meeting after the next one and so on, I think it will be much clearer, like they're just writing an article about the Vietnam War. <laughs> there's, you can have some debates about it, but there's, that's not going to be hard to understand. And they're writing an article about the Watts riot and about the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and let alone May 68 and so on. So, uh, uh, and I think uh, those kind of things will come together. Uh, but as I said, the next meeting, we're going to just read this one article in two parts, Basic Banalities by Raoul Vanajim. And it's his most important article for the SI. And it's kind of looking toward, um, uh, 
his book, which he started to write not long after that, called The Revolution of Everyday Life in the English translation. Uh, and the book is um, uh, one of the books that you all should read. You don't have to read it instantly, but uh, along with the situation of anthology and the society of the spectacle, the revolution of everyday life is just absolutely crucial. I mean, if you haven't read that, uh, you just have an enormous blind spot about what thousands of, or millions of people around the world are doing, you know, what they have been influenced by. Uh, but basic banalities is shorter than that but it's harder to understand. Uh, it's really sometimes pretty contorted. I was sort of joking, you know, at the beginning of the meeting uh, that, you know, there are times when you think, boy, he is intentionally making this as obscure as possible. Just, just saying like, screw you. If you can't understand that, it's your problem. <laughs> you know, we're not, uh, this is when he's sort of talking in the nitty gritty kind of stuff. But even in doing that, he comes up with, with great things that can be turned into a slogan or something. Uh, but there are other times where he's really delving in deeply about these these nuances of life versus survival, about nuances of ideology, uh, nuances of positive and negative. Uh, so he goes through the negative things like sacrifice, spectacle, different kinds of oppressions. And then he has the positive uh, thing, participation, realization, communication, the unit, what he calls the unitary triad. And this is great. And he develops that a lot more in the revolution of everyday life, but he's already talking about these uh, sort of um, positive aspects of the program that in many cases looks like it's just negative. The situationists are just criticizing everything right and left, but they're doing that. That's just the flip side of the fact that they're promoting communication, participation, realization, and how those three things have to interrelate with each other. So uh, don't be discouraged. You know, we're, uh, I think it'll total maybe yeah. about 35 pages or something like that. And that's all we're going to be doing. So we'll go over it pretty carefully. And I would suggest like read it carefully and probably reread it. You know, because if you just judge by your first impression, you're going to say, boy, well, what's going on here? This is... This is too much. But I think if you go through it and kind of, kind of consider the other things we've read so far, uh, you will find that it's an extremely rich text. Uh, it was actually one of the first situationist texts to be translated into English, uh, which is <laughs> kind of weird, you know, because it, like uh, it was one of the first situationist texts I read. And I thought, boy, these guys are... <laughs> Uh, this is pretty tough here. Uh, some of the it made some of the other ones look easy. So anyway, I encourage you to delve into that. Uh, I think you'll be very glad that you did. And we can just, you know, try to dig out what he means with all these things, and uh, that will prepare us. Every everything from then on is going to be like downhill. <laughs> we'll, we'll just be like sliding sliding down the mountain by comparison with that. So don't be discouraged, just dig in and I'll see you in a couple weeks. Uh, any final remarks? Okay, I'm going to now stop the recording.